All right, good afternoon. We're going to talk about the foundations of Islam. This is the second of the Lesson 9 video lectures. Now, Islam begins in the city of Mecca. You probably heard that, but you might wonder why Mecca. Well, back in the day, Mecca was located at the crossroads of a couple different caravan routes, so there were a lot of people going through the city. It connected Palestine and Syria to Yemen and Saudi Arabia. It connected Mesopotamia to Ethiopia and Eastern Africa. It was a real big crossroads and there were a lot of people going through the city of Mecca. It didn't have very much manufacturing though and it didn't have any agriculture. It's basically an oasis in the desert. Its primary economy was tourism and its primary economy was pilgrimage. Uh, Mecca was a religious center. Uh, there were 360 plus local gods that were represented in the city. So there are a lot of people going through there, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different religions. Now the person who actually founds Islam is Muhammad. You probably heard that name, but you don't know much about him. What we know about Muhammad is he was born around 570 AD. He was raised in the city of Mecca. He was actually orphaned at a young age. Uh, he marries a wealthy woman who was 25, or at, when he was 25, I should say. And then, for whatever reason, around the year 610, he goes to a local mountain, a mountain called Mark, mountain, uh, Mount Hira. And there he's visited by the archangel Gabriel, who says, you are a prophet of God. Now, it's really important to know Islam is not a new religion. It is based on Judaism. And there are five different pillars. There's the Shahada. There is one God. In Islam, they don't believe in the Trinity. There is no God, Father, God, Son, Holy Ghost, nothing like that. There is only one God, no Trinity. Uh, that is the way that Jews believe that there is no trinity, and there are even some Christians who believe there is no trinity. Uh, Salat means prayer. You were expected to pray to Allah, which is a translation of Yahweh, the Jewish God. And a good Muslim is supposed to pray five times a day. They're always supposed to pray towards Mecca, and those five prayers actually have five different names. Zakat is tithing. Christians are expected to tithe when you go to church, you know, when the fancy music plays and the, the plate gets passed around the congregation. Well, in Islam, they do the same thing. The biggest difference is in Islam, the tithing is, is expected and required. And Muslims see the tithing as a loan to God that will be repaid in the afterlife. You also have fasting or psalm. Um, the psalm or fasting in Islam is called Ramadan. They cannot have any food, drink, or pleasures during daylight hours. When the sun goes down, there are only certain things that they're allowed to eat, certain things are allowed to drink. Now, before you think that's a little bit weird, that does happen in Christianity as well. Uh, it is called Lent, right before Easter. And then in Judaism, they have that as well. It's called Passover. Now, the last of these pillars is called the Hajj, or pilgrimage. Every good Muslim was expected to go to Mecca once in their life. Now, we don't really have this very much in Christianity anymore, but at one point in time, a Christian was expected to go to either the Holy Land of Jerusalem or to Rome, but that has been done away with. Now, jihad, you've probably heard of that. Jihad means religious war. A lot of times in today's day and age, jihad and Islam go back to back, hand in hand together. But jihad is not part of Islam. Jihad is a twisting of Islam for one's own goals and needs. Now, there are two books of importance in Islam. One is the Quran. There are two different spellings depending on the English version or the Arab version. I've got them both there for you. Quran means recitation. That's supposed to be the words of God as recited to Muhammad. 
It contains 114 chapters. It's based on the Torah. It gives the beliefs as delivered to Muhammad. It gives the structure of the society, the do's, the don'ts. And it proclaims that the Torah and the Holy Bible are both divine sources. There's also something called the Hadith or Hadith. I apologize if I've got the pronunciation wrong. And that contains the record of Muhammad's words and Muhammad's actions. We also have an event called the Hijra. And in 622, Muhammad is forced to move to a city called Medina or Medina. It's about 200 miles north of Mecca. This re relocation was not voluntary. He was actually forced out of the city because the people of Mecca didn't agree with his beliefs. Muhammad remains in the city of Medina or Medina until 630. He attacks caravans. He convinces people to follow him. And once he's got enough support, he heads back to the city of Mecca. Um, he had conquers, he attacks, he takes over Mecca, and he kind of starts a government or a an empire that had Islam as its official religion. So the Hajira is where the idea of pilgrimage came from in Islam. Now after Muhammad dies, he dies in 632, and his close friend Abu Bakr is chosen to be the next leader. He becomes the leader of Islam, the commander of the army of the empire, the head of the Arab government, and the supreme judge for all the Muslims. So Abu Bakr, he's the religious leader, he's the military leader, and he is the government leader of his people. Abu Bakr is the leader for two years. He unites most of the Arab people together. And then he and his successor sent armies throughout Palestine, Syria, North Africa, and all the way over to India, and they slowly conquer more and more territory. Now, they weren't doing this in the name of Islam, but they, their official religion was Islam. So Islam spread along with the armies. Now, there are three different groups of Islam or three different types of Islam, and I apologize if I don't get this 100% correct. Uh, Shiites, they believe that a man named Ali, who was Muhammad's son-in-law, was the true successor of Muhammad. Now, Ali and Abu Bakr, they made an agreement to keep the religion together, that Ali wouldn't challenge Abu Bakr. But once Abu Bakr died and this guy named Uthman was assassinated, then Ali came forward and said, I was always supposed to be the true leader. Uh, Shiites, they believe that Muhammad was a prophet and they accept only the written laws and only the beliefs found within the Quran. If it's not in the Quran, they don't think it is correct. You have the Sunnis. The Sunnis believe that Abu Bakr was the successor of Muhammad. They believe that everything was going the way it was supposed to. And a Sunni believes in the traditions and the actions of Muhammad as well as the written laws and beliefs that are in the Quran. So they kind of take a wider view of the religion. The Sunnis were considered the mainstream belief until fairly recent times. Now Shiites are slightly more mainstream than Sunnis. You also have a group called the Sufis, and I honestly don't know a lot about them. I've had to research them. Sufis, they believe that the divine attributes of God are manifested in Muhammad. They're very much about mysticism and magic. Uh, they think Muhammad was a supreme human being and is the example and the master of all creatures. And they think that if you know Muhammad, then you know God, because Muhammad is the closest to God on the earth. Very often, Sufis and believe Sunni beliefs but they add in the magic, the mysticism, and this extra step. All right, there is an Islamic civilization that develops, um, the city of Baghdad. It's four times bigger than Constantinople. It becomes one of the great cities of the ancient times. Uh, there are over 1 million residents compared to about 500,000 in the city of Constantinople. In what is today Spain, there's the city of Cordoba, 
and it's one of the largest cities in Europe. It's got a population over 400,000. Uh, there's one particular mosque, which is a Islamic place of worship that seated 5,500 people. There are 900 baths, 1,500 mosques, 60,000 mansions, and 100,000 shops. That is more religious center locations than were located in Rome. And the library of Cordoba had over, I think it's 3,000 books when most Christian monasteries only had a couple dozen. So the Islamic civilizations are really going to preserve a lot of knowledge from the Greeks and the Romans and stuff like that. Now, Islamic culture, there are trading networks that go all the way from Europe to Asia. The Islamic civilizations really connect the world together. Uh, there is religious toleration for Christians and Jews. They were considered people of the book. Heathens, meaning non-Christians, non-Jews, non-Muslims, they were forcibly converted to Islam. And if you didn't choose to convert, then they would kill you. Women, not allowed in society. Men can have up to four wives, but every wife has to be financially supported. Now, the Muslims are going to go on to study medicine, science, philosophy, and things like modern banking, modern medicine. They all come from an Islamic source. And then once again, the Muslims are going to preserve ancient knowledge in libraries. When the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, as they're sometimes called of Europe, end, a lot of the knowledge that Europe discovers is going to come from these Islamic sources, but we'll talk about that more in the future. Now, just once again, I'm going to take you to our Blackboard page just to remind you of a couple things. But before I do that, I want to tell you that today's secret word is soap. Soap, soap, soap. Wash your hands. That way you can keep yourself from being sick. All right, I'm clicking on syllabus. Virtual office hours. Remember, you can connect with me on Discord. The course schedule is up to date, so I'll always check that. Your due dates are on the course schedule. Under lessons, lessons we are in lesson number nine for this week and what you'll find in lesson number nine secret word quiz so you can get those two secret words from this week and then powerpoint and lecture you'll see all the powerpoints that i'm posting and the lectures i'm, I'm posting all right, so that is all for this week. I hope you have a good weekend, and we will talk to you again on Tuesday. We'll see you later.